Welcome, everyone. We are here to uh, um, celebrate Corey Squire, who is the author of the book People, Planet, and Design, A Practical Guide to Realizing the Architect's Potential. Uh, Corey is joining us as an AIA's uh, member and a sustainability director at Bora Architecture and Interiors here in Portland, Oregon. He is a member of the AIA's Strategic Council and lectures nationally on a range of sustainability-related topics. He was a creator of the AIA Framework for Design Excellence, a resource that's actively redefining excellence in the built environment. Corey and I just spent a few minutes uh, talking and reminiscing about all the people that we know in common. So please welcome Corey. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, super excited, super excited to be here. Um, get through the continue education sections. <laughs> Learning objectives. Okay, and the talk today is practice transformation. Um, how any architecture firm can basically excel in sustainability on every project. This is the topic of my book and a topic that I spent a lot of time thinking about. So, start off by asking a question. Um, do you want to excel in sustainability, right? And this is how I, um, this is a question I ask to a lot of architecture firms. The follow-up question is then, do you believe in good design? Do these ideas have anything to do with each other? Um, I think they do, and over the course of this talk, my hope is to convince everybody else that these two ideas are kind of completely interwoven. So I am um, Sustainability Director at Bohr Architecture and Interiors here in Portland, Oregon. Um, we do architecture, interiors, um, experiential design. It's a 70-year-old firm, about 65 people. Um, and everything that we do as a firm is looked at through this lens of climate, health, and equity. This is the vision that we establish for our work moving forward. This is the purpose of our design. Um, and it's really how we evaluate every single design decision. But it, does, it wasn't always that way, right? This is a kind of a fairly new idea. Um, Bora has long had this deep sustainability ethos. This is a picture of Bora's beach house. We designed this for ourselves in the early 90s. Um, as kind of a retreat to get close to nature. Um, but up until just a few years ago, we were also designing projects like, like this one. Um, and I, I, I doubt that anybody needs a primer about the, the, the problems of all glass, all glass buildings. So as a sustainability leader, um, my fundamental job is changing culture, right? And that's what I've been doing um, both at the AIA through my work with the framework and the strategic council and also at Bora. Fundamentally, sustainability is not a fight. And we often kind of think that we're in the trenches, we're like fighting for a little additional insulation, maybe removing a few toxic chemicals. Uh, sustainability is also not about chasing after a project with a pooper scooper, right? It's not about cleaning up other people's mistakes, which it often uh, some, sometimes can seem like that. Um, if there's one takeaway from my talk today, the idea is that sustainability exists at the level of a practice. You can't address sustainability on a project-by-project -project basis, it just doesn't work. Um, and I think that's been a mistake that a lot of firms have been attempting for a long time. Um, and here's, here's, here's why it doesn't work, right? I'm gonna give you an example. This is a typical um, kind of portfolio of an architecture firm. We have projects along the horizontal axis, um, and then project performance along the vertical axis of this graph, right? And most projects at a typical firm's portfolio are somewhere around typical. Uh, typical might be code minimum, it might be whatever is socially acceptable in a given jurisdiction. Um, and then there is a sustainable project, right? This could be the bullet center, right? This could be RMI. Um, even Bora had a sustainable project. This is Creekside Elementary School, not far from here. It was our first net zero energy education space. Um, but the problem with the one sustainable project is there's always some sort of a story that sets it apart. And we accept the fact that all the projects are gonna be over here, but there's a reason that the sustainable project is over here, and we put extra effort into it. Like, maybe the story is that the client founded Earth Day or something like that. Um, but what really matters is what happens in all the other projects, right? The goal of practice transformation is to take this and transform it into this, right? Uh, this is what real sustainability looks like. So, so how do we get there? How do we shift our practices from sustainability being the special thing that's reserved for a subset of projects 
to just be the normal way that we do things. So I'll step back a little bit. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of kind of my history, where kind of where I've been and how these how I've been developing kind of some of these ideas over time. So this is a picture of me on my first day in the profession. <laughs> Uh, my first day of work after graduate art school was at SQ Dumas Ripple in New Orleans, and I was reading electrical meters. Um, uh, Z Smith, my, my supervisor at the time, uh, thought that this is the perfect way of kind of being introduced to sustainability. So we just completed, the firm just completed a 400 unit um, tower in downtown New Orleans. Um, and then once a month, I would go to the building and I would read every electrical meter um, and record it on this, on this uh, spreadsheet and then uh, analyze it at something. And, and, but the lesson here was that we spent a lot of time thinking about sustainability while we're designing. We spent time in analyzing our designs. None of that matters unless it ends up in the meter, as in like has a real impact in the real world. So um, I took this idea around kind of evidence-based design, outcome-based design uh, to Lake Flato, where I was a sustainability manager for a number of years. Um, here's a living building challenge project that we designed. It's called the Josie Pavilion. I love this picture because the wastewater treatment plant is right in front, right? It's a, it's a design element. It's kind of fundamental to the performance of the project, but also fundamental to the appearance of the project. Um, and and over, those, over those years um, that I was at Lake Flata, we kind of created a lot of high performance projects, really focusing on this outcome-based approach. Um, in 2018, I was selected to join the AI's Committee on the Environment. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is that group, this is the committee. We're holding an impromptu demonstration in front of the White House at the time. <laughs> uh, uh, Angie Brooks from Brooks Scarpa kind of made these signs in her office and brought them on the plane so that we can, we can <laughs> create this, this image. Um, sustainability was an incredibly important topic at the time and it seemed to be under threat um, from, from the government, um, kind, of, kind of perennial challenges around climate change. Um, but the AI was not really leading on this topic, right? There was the USGBC, which is kind of architecture adjacent, also includes other groups that kind of really define sustainability at the time. But what the Committee on the Environment had was the Coat Top 10 design program, right? And, and that's about 25 years old over the last quarter century. Um, kind of Coat Top 10 award-winning projects have really defined what is possible. Um, in terms of sustainable design, a collection of beautiful projects that excel on energy, excel on water, excel on health, all these different things. So here are the top 10 measures of sustainable design. And we thought for a second, what if we could take these top 10 measures that define the top 10 awards program and kind of adopt that into the AIA's definition of sustainable design? Um, we were going to call this something along the lines of the AIA framework for sustainable design. But then we thought, what if we take this a step further? What if we don't just call this the AI framework for sustainable design, but we called it the AI framework for design excellence? Basically, thoroughly integrating the idea of design and sustainability. So our committee, we went to the board of directors at the AIA um, and said, we have this great idea. You're going to love it. We're going to make this framework for design excellence. And they said, thanks, but no thanks. And um, we want to keep awarding glass buildings. So don't. don't so don't get into, yeah, yeah, don't get in our way, like don't, don't, don't stop our fun, right? So we put together a resolution. Uh, we brought the resolution to the floor of the conference in, um, in Las Vegas in 2019. And we asked for three things. We asked the AI to declare an urgent and sustained uh, climate imperative. Um, we want to transform day-to-day -day practice for all architects by adopting the, what we were calling the coat top 10, um, Coat top 10 measures as a new framework for design excellence, and then to utilize external messaging to build support for these ideas. We had no idea what was going to happen, um, but the measure ended up passing with about 93% of the vote. There is so much hunger out there for kind of doing this type of work that we don't always recognize um, how much people want to do it. They just need to be given the tools, given the resources, given the opportunity to create super high performing projects. So, and then this is it today. This is the Framework for Design Excellence. It's on the website. It's every awards program for the AIA is looked at through the Framework for Design Excellence. If you want to submit for the firm award, you have to explain why you're complying with, with the Framework for Design Excellence. If you want to submit for FAIA, you're going to talk about how your work um, relates to the Framework for Design Excellence. Um, so we were successful in kind of redirecting the focus of the institute, the profession, towards sustainable design as good design. 
So around this time, I left traditional practice and I started my own consulting firm. It was called Department of Sustainability. The idea here was that I was going to use my experience at Lake Flato and with the AIA to really help firms across the country um, excel in sustainability. The consulting also gave me the opportunity to kind of pursue some questions that I had had. Right? Why do some projects perform better than others? Or taking that a step further, why do some practices perform better than others? Why are some practices consistently putting out high-performing projects while others are really struggling to just create one or two? Um, and then through my consulting practice, this is really what I've learned. Um, to excel in sustainability, you need two things. You need the right knowledge and you need the right culture. Right? If you have the right knowledge but you don't have the right culture, that means you know exactly what to do to create high-performing projects, but you might not have the opportunity to do it. And if you have the right culture, uh, but not the right knowledge, you might be like all gung-ho to get started and just have no idea what to do. But there is a gap in the literature, right? There's lots of resources out there that describe high-performance design strategies, and a lot of them haven't been updated since the 70s. Um, but there wasn't really anything out there that said, um, now that you know what to do, this is actually how you implement this into a project in an office with the complexities that we're dealing with, right? So I wrote this book. Um, and this is my answer to this problem, trying to combine the right knowledge with the right culture into a single resource that would allow firms to really transform towards consistent high performance projects. So a little bit about the book. The book is about design, right? It's not about sustainability. Um, fundamentally, I don't even use the word sustainability in the book. I think during the preface, I like, explain that I'm not going to use the word sustainability, and then I don't mention the word again. Because that's not really what we're doing. We're not trying to lay some other criteria on top of existing criteria, we're trying to redefine what the criteria for success is. And the book is based on a few premises. Right? The first premise is that good design solves problems. Um, if you're not solving a problem, or you're not solving a relevant problem, or you're exacerbating an existing problem, right, we shouldn't be considering that design. And it's definitely not good design. Um, the book assumes that we have all the knowledge and technology that we need. right? 200 years ago, all buildings were basically um, passive, using passive strategies, using renewable energy. Um, at some point in the future, we'll probably get back there. We don't need to wait for nuclear fusion to allow us to have lower window wall ratios. Like we, we basically have the tools. We have the resources. Another premise is the constraints are not what they seem. Right? Often we say that we can't create this high performance project because we don't have the budget or the client's not interested. And I'll revisit that in a little bit, but I do not think that is fundamentally the reason. I don't think that's what's holding us back. And then the last premise is that the environment influences outcomes. This could be the office environment, the physical environment you're working in, or the social environment, um, how you kind of engage with each other, what the design process looks like. This is that right culture piece. Um, but at the same time, the barriers to doing high performance projects are, are real, right? And they could be addressed individually, right? One barrier is complexity. Um, sustainable, sorry, design, architecture is a really complicated process. And often it feels like sustainability is just laid on top of that, right? adding additional complexity without providing any additional fee or time to deal with it. There's a barrier of prioritization. right? If you look at a list of sustainable strategies, like a lead checklist, it might give you a point for, for energy, it might give you a point for water, but um, there is no equivalency between the importance of window wall ratio, which impacts almost everything important about a project's performance, with something like low flow fixtures, which is just solved by purchasing something. There's a barrier of distraction, right? Often, when I was a consultant, firms would come to me, the first question they'd ask is, what energy modeling software should we use? And I would be like, we have to go way back. <laughs> um, you need to know what question you want to ask before you can approach the answer, right? And then there are a lot of companies out there that think they can sell you a solution through a product, and it's just doesn't work that way. And there's a barrier of purpose, right? Are we mistaking the goal of completing a checklist with a more fundamental goal of just providing for human thriving? At the same time, we know what the barriers are not, right? Cost is not a barrier, right? We often think cost is, not, is a barrier, but it's not, right? When, uh, when, when budgets get tight, um, what do clients choose to spend their money on? Are they cutting insulation or are they cutting more expensive finishes? Right? Design is not a barrier. Right? There's plenty of ugly, <laughs> uh, poor performers. There's also plenty of high-performing, um, beautiful buildings. 
And interest is not a barrier. And this I, I learned from working with probably hundreds of project teams where I haven't seen any indication that project teams that are more um, personally interested or excited or passionate about sustainability result in higher performing projects, right? Because um, people often kind of check their passion at the door and just go along with whatever the cultural norms of the situation are. Same thing, so personal commitment to sustainability, love of hiking, people who spend a lot of time outdoors, they don't produce higher performing buildings either. So, so what do we do? Like, um, what we need is a holistic approach that again combines the right strategies with the right culture to create the buildings that we all want. So this is how I organize my book, kind of thinking about this, trying to think about this holistically, right? Aside from achieving the client's program and hitting the budget and achieving the schedule, like what, do we, what, is it, what are the goals? What are the right outcomes for our projects? What are we trying to achieve, right? Human equity, human health, carbon reduction, ecology, these are all fundamental things, right? Um, so defining the right outcome was the first step. Second step is to trace these outcomes back to building systems. Some building systems um, are very impactful for certain outcomes, some are not, so it's important to align the tools that we have to work with with the outcomes that we want to achieve. Step three for organizing the book was to align outcomes um, and systems with design strategies. So for instance, if carbon reduction is a major goal and Windows is the design system that you're working with, then the right facade um, organization might be kind of how you leverage this building system toward this end. And finally, step four is to create an environment to make it happen. This means a shared mission and vision across a firm. I mentioned climate, health, and equity at Bora. This is our shared mission and vision, right? We, we all came together to define that, we all agree on it, and we all work towards those goals every day. Access to knowledge is really essential. Effective communication, having good incentives, make sure that people are rewarded for good behavior and not accidentally kind of discouraged from good behavior through unintentional incentives. Um, safety through social belonging, we can all talk freely about our, our goals and values and sustainability broadly. Um, when I worked in Texas, people felt very uncomfortable talking about sustainability because it wasn't kind of an accepted cultural norm the way that it is in Portland. Um, but you can create that cultural norm within an office environment. And then practicing and living shared values. Basically, the right knowledge and the right culture. And then combining those two things is how we can transform practice. So um, this was my precedent for writing a book. I don't know if anyone has read this book. It's, it's excellent, so I totally recommend it. But basically, uh, the author tried to distill good cooking down into four essential elements, right? Salt, fat, heat, and acid. And, it, and she says that if you add more salt, your lentils will taste better. And, and it really works. Um, and, um, and what I tried to do was kind of take sustainable design, which I think is a little bit more complicated, but that could, that's probably arguable, and distill it down as much as possible um, into these kind of fundamental elements that get us to the right answer. And similar to that book, um, I use illustrations. My, my wife illustrated the book. Uh, she's also an architect. And um, the idea was to convey complicated ideas through simple strategies. Um, because often things get lost in the complication, and if you can communicate them effectively, you can get things done. So sources of indoor air pollution. This is a diagram showing the impact of parking, um, kind of an urban downtown. Um, the difference between a skin-dominated building and a, and a load-dominated building. Um, but then fundamentally, the, project, the book is a roadmap for practice transformation. Um, and I, in the book, I use the same strategy that I developed when I was consulting um, for different, different firms. So here's the approach. I called it the elements of a high-performance practice, um, somewhat inspired by uh, by the elements of, of good cooking. <laughs> um, but basically, there's that vision on the top, culture, process, resources, and strategies, um, kind of in a descending order of prioritization. Right? The, op um, the opening move is to kind of collectively and thoroughly define what sustainable design is, or really what good design is. What is the ultimate goal for an architecture practice? So return to that question from the beginning. Um, good design, sustainable design, they are the same thing. Right? And, it's, and I, I'm not just saying that because I personally love sustainable design or that I, I love the appearance of solar panels or whatever else. It's like 
fundamentally, um, that, is, that, that, just, that is just the case. Um, and I spend the first three chapters of the book kind of making this argument. The easiest way to make the argument is looking at the inverse. And you say that human harm would be bad design. Right? If Let's say that every time you picked up your cell phone, um, it gave you an electric shock or burst into flames or, or something. You would call that bad design, right? <laughs> because it's not doing what you want to do. It's actually harming you in the process. Um, so for architecture, uh, we, can make this, uh, we can make this case by looking at this schism um, that I described in the book that kind of developed between form and function over the past 100 years or so. 100 years ago, buildings had to use form to provide function, right? So here's an aerial picture of Toledo, Spain. Um, every single room in this building has access to the exterior. There are windows that light the space. It was the only way the space could be lit, right? The buildings are close together so that people can travel from one to the other. Uh, likewise, if you wanted a large space, um, you, needed to, you needed tall ceilings, you needed large windows to light it, right? That was the only way, the form is the only way that you could provide function. Uh, but this all changed with fossil fuels, right? Um, suddenly we had electricity to provide lighting, so floor plates got deeper, ceilings came down, people were pulled further away from the exterior world. Um, similarly, we could use gasoline rather than human power for traveling, so cities got spaced out and we lost things like human connection and kind of movement in our daily lives. So cheap energy over the past hundred years really freed design from its physical constraints. Uh, allowed us to do things that we never would have been able to do otherwise. Um, but then the question that comes up is that what did we gain from all of this, right? We gained the ability to like scribble on a napkin <laughs> and call it good design. When in reality it's the exact opposite of what good design is. Without function, without the, the need for our design work to provide function, we lose meaning, right? It just becomes random. It becomes swirls, it becomes this weird canopy thing. It, become, it becomes things that are not grounded in physical reality. And function is the people part, right? We forget that, that buildings are fundamentally for people, both the occupants of the buildings, but also the surrounding community and everybody else that is impacted by our design decisions. So in the book, I look at this idea of form and function on a continuum, um, where you have pure form is like a work of art, right? So we have the Rodin here, it doesn't do anything, but it looks beautiful. And then we have pure function on the other side. Um, and I use a traffic cone, right? Nobody loves it, it's not beautiful, but it's very effective and it works for what it needs to do. And then right in the middle of this combination of form and function, we have a building, right? Or in this example, we have a bicycle. It's a beautiful form, but it's also the only form that would allow it to function the way that we need it to function, to, 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 use, to do its purpose. And what's really interesting about a bicycle is let's say we want it to perform better. Let's say, for instance, we want it to go faster. The form changes, right? It becomes more aerodynamic, it becomes sleeker, your position changes on the bicycle. Um, or let's say that we want to have a different function. Say we want to carry kids, right? The form changes, and it all makes sense. They're all, they're all beautiful, beautiful objects um, because they express what their form is. Now, there's no world where we would create bicycles that look like this, right? Because there is no function that could be achieved by this form other than just the bicycle not working. Um, and this is the all glass box, right? This is the western facing curtain wall. This is the building full of toxins, right? This is what the fossil fuel era has led us to believe good design is. Um, but we can back out of this, right? We can reclaim this idea of form and function, which is what we today call sustainability. So at the same time, um, over the past maybe 50 years or so, there was another schism that kind of developed in the architecture and design world. And this was the separation between design and sustainability. Um, again, 100 years ago, there was no such thing as a sustainable building because buildings had to adhere to what we today call sustainable strategies for them to be able to function at all, right? Buildings would have been harvested from local materials. They would have been designed um, to accommodate passive strategies. Um, there was a point when we didn't fill our buildings with toxins just because there weren't that many toxins available to fill our buildings with. Um, but then what happened is as an overreaction to the fossil fuel era, the early quote unquote sustainable buildings were very weird, right? <laughs> and, um, um, and they kind of created this idea in the public's imagination that if you want to be sustainable, you need to be eccentric. You need to like live out on your own and, and like build your building out of, um, I don't know, 
tires <laughs> or whatever, right? And everyone kind of just agreed with this idea. There was this dichotomy where you had a design project um, and it didn't really matter how it performed. And then you had the sustainable project and it didn't really matter how it looked. And I think that hopefully by adopting the framework for design excellence and through the example of the Code Top 10 award-winning projects, we can reconnect this idea of design sustainability. Right? Good design needs to do it all, right? Otherwise, it's just not good design. There's no reason why we can't have high-performing projects that also look great. So that was kind of step one is like at the level of a firm or even at the level of a practice of a profession of architecture, be very clear about what sustainable design is and what good design is and what our ultimate goals are. Okay, so step two is firm culture is either the headwind or the tailwind to get there, right? This is the right culture. So here is a picture of a design pinup. This is a design principal who's reviewing some work. What is she saying? What message is she communicating to the office, right? Is she saying, how does this design address air quality? Air quality is super important. People care about the air quality of their building. Are we discussing that during pinups? How does this project improve the lives of the people who live nearby? How does the design reduce carbon emissions? Or is she just saying, what, is the, what does the building look like? Right? And whether those conversations or what conversations are taking place during the design pinup is really essential for the design culture of an office. Um, in, my, in my book, I kind of do a, a quick kind of exploration of two different corporate leaders who create very different um, corporate environments, right? Um, often the culture of a, of a practice comes all the way from the top, um, and you have Uber versus uh, Patagonia kind of really mimicking the values and the personas of their founders in kind of completely different ways. Um, but establishing a new culture is, is challenging, right? It takes, you have to recognize what exists, you have to kind of take the time and commitment and understand where you want it to go. Um, and once you go through this process, um, it becomes clear that the barriers to sustainable design are not cost, not the fact that things aren't penciling out, um, but it's about the culture, it's about priorities, it's about discussions that we're having, it's about how we communicate these ideas. Right? Um, again, too often cost is blamed as a barrier, but cost is just a manifestation of priorities, and priorities are really based on values and knowledge. And if you change the values, or you increase the knowledge, then the priorities change, the cost change, the whole challenge of cost kind of just goes away. Okay, and then here's step three. So we did what is sustainable design, or what is good design? How does the firm culture impact design? And then step three is to prioritize simple and effective design strategies that you can repeat over and over again um, that, that kind of are time tested, that are low tech, that work. Um, there, are, there are companies out there who have a vested interest in making you think that sustainable design is very complicated, right? Again, there's the simulation tools that are like, oh, we can do multivariable optimization. You can run this or run that or whatever. But in reality, sustainable design is much simpler, right? When it's hot, you want to keep the sun out. That, that seems fairly clear. You don't need a multivariable optimization to figure that one out. So I'm going to give a quick case study of a, a BOR project that recent, recently completed here in Portland. This is Holgate Library in the southeast. Uh, for those in the room, totally recommend visiting it if you have not already. It's a beautiful project. And um, it was the first project where design started after, at BOR after I became sustainability director. Um, we started this project with a goal setting workshop. Right? We wanted the whole team to get on board with what we were trying to achieve as the client, the consultants, our whole internal team, and we set some really clear goals that we wanted to achieve. We used benchmarking to then apply numbers to those goals. So what is the typical energy use of a library in Portland? Um, how can we be better than that? And then when we started designing, we already had a fairly clear idea of what we wanted to achieve, uh, which is really, really important from day one. So the site that we were given is a north-south oriented site. Um, but we knew that an east-west oriented building would be better from a heat gain standpoint um, and also better from a daylight standpoint. So we took our building, we went with option C in this model, um, and we, we laid out our building in an east-west orientation on that north-south site. We then took our program blocks um, 
our kind of support spaces or bathrooms, anything without windows, and we push those to the east-west facade. What this allowed us to do was block out harsh solar heat gain and block out harsh light, um, and then maximize the north and south facades where daylight is easier to control and heat gain is easier to control for the primary daylighting strategy. And then because the building, because of site constraints, the building was deeper than we otherwise would have wanted, um, we used daylight simulation to just optimize a skylight to bring light into the center of the building. So all the strategy I described so far, which is probably 90% of the way towards this super high performing project, are cost neutral, right? It's just orientation, it's program arrangement, it's putting in a skylight. Um, in addition, we use FSC certified wood, the, the mechanical system is an in-floor radiant hydronic system, which is only possible because we were able to decrease the heating, sorry, the cooling load uh, by blocking out the western, western sun. Um, we even included operable windows, which were against the county standard. We wrote a series of memos explaining why they're essential for air quality and resilience, um, and we were able to get them, get them in. I, I don't know if they'll ever be opened, but that's a different thing. And here's the project today. These are some of the first kind of professional photographs that we got. Um, here's the interior, here's that skylight uh, kind of that brings light down into the central atrium. Um, I did daylight measurements in this building. We were able to shut off all the lights, which was actually a huge challenge. It's always frustrating when you, <laughs> when you try to cut off, shut off lights in the building. I took daylight measurements and you almost couldn't even tell that the lights were off. Um, and here's, that, here's the kids section, kind of with that uh, mass timber kind of exposed. So a few weeks after the project opens, I, I spent a day there. Um, I brought my air quality meter. That's that thing on the, on the, <laughs> on the table. Um, the, the 100 that's being recorded is 100 out of 100 um, from an air quality metric. This is almost perfect performing air quality. Um, VOCs were way low. CO2 was way low. There were no particulates. Um, and this just so happened to be during a heat wave with a wildfire smoke in the area. Um, and it just shows kind of what design strategies can do um, to improve performance. So, so that's it. That's, that's, that's the three steps. So not that difficult, right? To find sustainable design, make sure firm culture is working for you, and then identify those effective strategies that you can repeat over and over again. Um, and I'm going to finish with a quote uh, from, um, from the forward of the book, which I think kind of summarizes the approach fairly well. Uh, this is Z. Smith writing this. The tra transition from today's destructive ways of living to something better has often been framed as self-denial. What are you willing to give up? But instead, the book asks, what are you willing to gain? Right? Would you be willing to have buildings be more joyful, more beautiful, more comfortable? Would you be willing to pay less for utilities? Would you be willing to spend time in buildings that help you move and be healthier in communities where everything was close and nearby and where everyone felt welcome? When sustainability comes up in conversation, people automatically assume, what am I going to sacrifice for this? But what if instead we presented sustainability or design as something that benefits the client, right? That they can gain something from it. So with that, I'm going to thank you. Um, thank you for the, for the opportunity to come present today. We're going to do a Q&A in a minute. Um, I also wanted to share that if you wanted to purchase the book, um, we have a website on the screen. Island Press is the publisher. Um, and you have your very own coupon code. You can put in Canon for 25% off. <laughs> um, so thanks, everyone. We're going to go over to Q&A. Yeah. Are we getting so chairs? What's the plan for Q&A? We, we can just gonna, stand. We can just stand. We can just, stand. We can just hang out. OK. And here's the book. Yeah. I didn't get 25% off, so you can just pay me. I could just, oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> uh, do some retroactive couponing. So we'll have the code for questions so everybody online can do it, but we can open up to questions in the room, or I brought questions to start. Go ahead and grab that handheld mic. Oh, yeah, right. He told me to use the mic. You're good on the mic. I'm still good He's on this, mic. right? Sure, yeah, you're uh, So we have, quite, we have an online code that will come up so you guys can post questions and I'll check them here. Uh, we can open up to questions in the room yeah, to start. Should I just shift that over? But I have a question, uh, and it is, it is perhaps the number one question that I get and probably every sustainability director gets, which is, uh, how do you win a code award? <laughs> what's, the, what's the secret? Everyone, 1,300 people are listening now wanting to know how to win a code award. 
So yeah, please so, tell them. So before, before I went to Lake Plato, um, I, was, oh, I don't need the microphone, I have one. Before I went to Lake Plato, I was at the firm Eski Demons Ripple, and we really wanted to win a code award. Um, and then there was this joke when I took the job at Lake Plato that there was like a vault in the office, um, and I was going to get the code to this vault, which was the key to winning the code award. Um, and I was going to share it with everyone. <laughs> Democratize sustainable design awards. Um, but then I got to Lake Plato, and I realized the secret is you just submit 100 times. So every year, we submitted like five Coat Top 10 awards. Um, and, and if it didn't win, we submitted it again next year. I think we would submit like three or four times. Um, and if it didn't win on the fourth time, then we would pull it. Um, but there's definitely strength in numbers. But in order to be able to do that, you need to design really good projects, right? You can't just submit anything for a Coat Top 10 award. Um, and I would say the key to designing great projects is very similar to kind of those, those simple strategies that I described, right? Get the orientation right, get the wind to wall ratio right. Um, and you need a great story, right? The jury is looking for a story. They're just, they're, juries, who knows if the jury is even capable of interpreting the metrics correctly? Um, they need a good story. So story and strength in numbers is the, is the key there. My next question uh, is you're married to an architect. I am, yeah. Helena, she did the illustrations in the book. My next question is who wins? with furniture decisions in the house? Uh, <laughs> we, so we recently bought a house here in Portland, um, and I thought that this would take us forever to be able to agree on it. And like very magically, we both loved the same house, um, and it all worked out. Though we do rearrange the furniture almost weekly. Uh, so we, no, nobody's won on that yet. We decided, our, our son is four, we decided we're not gonna get nice furniture until he like goes to college. So. <laughs> So we have another 14 years to figure out what furniture arrangement we finally want to settle on. And I think that'll, that'll be enough time. OK, I'll open it up to the rooms. Any questions here in the room for the esteemed? Yes, sir. What's your opinion on smart buildings? So you mentioned the library. Get the mic there. Just so the people online can hear. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to get your opinion on smart bu buildings. You mentioned the library project may or may not rely on the operable windows, but the Ability to for the occupants to modify their space seems to uh, be desirable. Yeah, hundred percent. So in 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 my perfect world, the buildings would have operable windows, and they would also be able to be opened by anyone they want. Um, I'm very skeptical of of the idea of like actuators that are going to open windows or computer programs that are going to tell you when to open windows. Um, I think that people should just be able to occupy operate their own space in a way that makes them happy, in the way that makes them comfortable. Um, and I'm very skeptical about kind of shutting down controls or handing over controls to like a central control or facility person. Um, at my own office at Bora, we have something like, I don't know, 10 thermostats for different zones within the office. And I actively encourage everyone, if you're uncomfortable, change the thermostat, right? But, but after a year, it's like this has been ingrained in us as a culture that we're not allowed to touch the thermostat. We're not allowed to change our environment. So I just hope that occupants will just like, uh, first of all, be given the opportunity to change their environment, to open their window, to adjust their thermostat, and then people will accept that. And I think that if everybody kind of adjusts things in the way that makes them comfortable, we'll come up to some, uh, some nice, reasonable um, kind of outcome for everyone. So that's the approach. Um, but we need to continue creating buildings where things can be um, operated and encouraging people to operate them. That building, it just opened because I went, I went opening weekend. Yes. There's a big party. Yep. And it's at Holgate. It's close. And it's the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the first new library in Multnomah County in like 15 years. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. It's the, we're, we're, there's, there's currently nine new libraries that are under design and construction in Nomoa County, and this is the first one that's open. And my favorite part of it is the, the, central, the central stairwell is all skylit and daylit. Yeah. And this happens at the new airport, too, yeah. that another firm that we will not mention designed. <laughs> but, but everybody walks in, and, they're, I love and they it. just look up. Yeah. Immediately, their head goes up. And I, that happens at the airport, too. And yeah. I love it. And there's this biophilic aspect to not just the light, but then the wood. And similar to the airport, which has full height trees, um, Holgate Library is full of plants. Um, and the project was, was completed, and we went to look at it, and it was nice, but then they put in the plants, and then, now it, and then it's beautiful. Yeah. So. All right, so we have a, a lot of questions online. Okay. Uh, 
What were some of the obstacles that you helped firms overcome when trying to change the culture? So often, often the issue is, um, so I talk a lot about incentives in the book. And some incentives are intentional, right? And some are unintentional. Um, and I often would work with firms to identify any sort of negative incentives that are kind of impacting that, like um, holding them back from their potential. So a few examples. Let's say that there's a design principal who's just not so comfortable with um, technical sustainability topics. And a client asks a question about, I don't know, a mechanical system or energy efficiency or whatever else. And the design principal in the meeting might just kind of defer the question, even though there might be an expert at the table who just doesn't feel empowered to answer that question, like almost like out of, out of um, I don't know, hierarchy of some sort. Um, so one thing that we worked on was like making sure that whoever is kind of the senior person in the room is able to actively defer to whoever might be the expert in the room. Uh, that's, been, that's been really success successful. Another has to do with, another thing that comes up a lot is kind of, let's say, um, not recognizing that there is built-in incentives or inherent incentives to act on anything related to budget or schedule um, because there's this quick feedback loop, right? So if a project goes over budget, everybody knows it. Um, if a project goes beyond schedule, everybody knows it. If the project uses 20% more energy, nobody will know it. Um, and if they do know it, it'll be years and years later, which means that everybody personally feels responsible um, for taking care of the things that they will be held responsible for um, and not necessarily taking responsibility for the really important things um, where they won't be held responsible at a later date. So in the book, I call this kind of the inherent priority of schedule, budget, and appearance. And then say the fourth thing, performance, is always going to be at the bottom of the list. And if you don't have time, you're just not going to get to it. So what a firm has to do is create a culture that actively incentivizes focusing on performance. And this could be setting time aside for discussions about performance, performance pinups, making sure that performance is, is discussed whenever a project is presented to the office, um, intentionally um, recognizing people who put an extra effort around performance. Um, so just understanding that doing nothing does not create an even playing field. <laughs> Um, just because there's other aspects of design that are always going to rise to the surface. There's always going to be emergencies. Um, and we need to find ways to intentionally incentivize people to act towards the major goals that we have around energy, health, equity, all these important things. I'm smiling. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> I agree with you. But I'm smiling because this is essentially the playbook that the entire sustainability team has been following for years that we've been tying performance to design, doing it faster and faster, doing it shoulder to shoulder. As we say, we're, design, we're doing energy modeling with the speed of design right. so we can keep up with them so they can see. They don't have to wait a year. Right. It's the only way that, right, you have to speed up that feedback loop. Get yeah, people I, to know the impacts of their design decisions. You, you had time. it, you had it, like when you showed the library side, I don't know if anybody noticed in the upper right corner that said the EUI was 17. A typical hospital is like 400. <laughs> so, you know, that's impressive. I mean, that's, it's like a nine volt battery powers that. <laughs> yeah. In my library, basically. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, this one's um, interesting. Okay, so are you still involved with the AIA framework for design excellence, and are there any changes being planned, and has the framework impacted third party certifications like LEED, in your opinion? Um, so I don't think so. The, the framework is very intentionally a design vision, not a certification system. Um, People often confuse as a checklist, like I'll do design for equitable communities, I'll do design for water, but that's not what it is, right? You're supposed to pick and choose what's relevant to your project. It's supposed to kind of create this goal for the profession and for firms and for individual projects to achieve. So, um, so my role at the AIA, I'm a member of the Strategic Council, um, which is kind of, I don't know, without going too deep into AI governance, there is a board of directors, which is like 12 people, and then there's a strategic council right below that, which is like a representative from every state, so about, plus a few more people, so about 60 people. Um, and the strategic council has the role of advising the board 
around both regional issues and topic issues. So I was brought on the Strategic Council as a sustainability expert um, and an expert around the framework for design excellence. So my role is I get to advise the board about what we should be doing in the future and how we can kind of support um, this, this work now. So it's a volunteer position like many AIA things. There's an added benefit of Strategic Council. You get to serve as the jury for the, um, for the firm award and for the gold medal recipients. Um, and in that capacity, I get to really push for us to award the firms and the individuals who have been championing these ideas. Um, but I'm not actively kind of writing the updates to the framework for design excellence currently. There's a whole committee that was created to do that. I, I loved, you know, it's funny, you showed Michael Reynolds' Earthship in Taos, oh, yeah. New Mexico, and I've been to that building. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I helped build, not that one, but I helped build. The tire building. And it's basically literally old tires that you fill with dirt and then cover with yeah. earth and plaster. And it's super cool. Like, I don't want to. You said, you said, oh, this is uh, function over design. I, I thought that was beautiful. Well, I know. I think I mean, it's super cool, right? It's yeah. super cool. But from the perspective of the general public, they suddenly felt like, well, I need to that. choose one or the other, right? Yeah. I need to live in an Earthship or I need to live in a regular building. And what I, what I want to say is, like, if you want to live in nurship, that's great, but choosing to not live in nurship doesn't mean that sustainability is not for you, right? It's, there's multiple manifestations of design and sustainability. And by the way, the guy that built the earthship is exactly what you would picture <laughs> the guy that lives in a tire house looks like. It's on a playa in Taos. Taos is far from everything. Yeah. Uh, Big hippie, smells like weed. You know, the whole deal. So yeah, you got everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, every every checklist, the hemp clothing, all of it. All right, so uh, this one's interesting. We don't have developer clients, really. Okay. But the question's about developers. How do you get clients on board like a, like a for-profit developer whose value system is very different? Yeah, so if, if a developer is going to flip a property and you can't make any term, term any form of long-term investment argument, it becomes really challenging. Um, if you can convince that developer that they'll flip the property at a premium, that's like that's the best approach. And sometimes you can do that, and sometimes you can't. But that's that's how we do it. Not quite a for-profit developer, but recently in, at Bora we were working with an affordable housing developer. Um, and Bora, we we were very clear about the fact that we don't use um, PVC flooring, um, and we often fight clients on this. Um, so we were, we were working with this affordable housing developer. We were kind of in a meeting with the client, the contractor, and the design team going through an SD budget. And the contractor's like, we'll have this $200,000 or $200, ad for non-PVC um, flooring. And the client was like, why would we spend $200,000 on non-PVC flooring? And every member of the design team in the room um, from the principal in charge down to senior designers, like chimed in to explain why the PVC flooring is not aligned with their values. Um, and it ended the conversation. It was like, that was it, that was done. And we had rehearsed that, right? We, know, <laughs> we, we knew these questions were gonna come up. And we prepared, um, and we prepared answers for these questions. Um, and it was, it was a great moment for me, because I saw in action, like, how you can just change someone's mind to the fact where they're willing to accept, yeah, two hundred thousand dollars is like obviously we're not going to we're not going to save two hundred thousand dollars at the expense of the health of our occupants or at the expense of like not aligning with our vision. Um, so I think that communication is valuable in every context. Um, we should always talk about what our values are, even if the clients don't align with our values initially. And sometimes you um, lose those battles, but I think that you win more often than, from my experience, you can win more often than you might assume. Um, so it's always worth having the conversations. We do a lot of healthcare. Yeah. There's lots of PVC flooring. Lots of PVC wall covering <laughs> and flooring in healthcare. Uh, and we have this conversation every week. I had it I had it twice this week with our clients. And what's interesting to me is they everything you're saying is true. Yeah. If I, I was in a I was in a workshop this week with um, both administrative people and providers, doctors and providers in the room. And they all agreed, this is our value. We should not put chemicals of concern. It was a children's hospital. <laughs> we should not put chemicals of concern in a children's hospital. They all agree. Yeah. And I go, great. So we're agreed. We're not going to do PVC flooring. And then there's like a beat. And then someone goes, <clears throat> but there's always the but. Yeah. And it's always the facility people. It's easy to clean and it's cheap. But, it, <laughs> but 
you know, and I'm like, but what? We just agree. Every, we just weren't agreed. you here? We just agreed. Okay. Um, how do you deal with that when they're prioritizing maintenance and durability over a pretty substantial, tangible thing that aligns with their mission statement, like we're a children's hospital right. where sick children go, or we're a cancer center where cancer patients go? How do you deal with that? So, I mean, maintenance and durability are important goals. They're just not the only goals, right? There are products that are also easy to maintain and durable and non-toxic. Um, so a lot of the conversation needs to be less around don't do this and more about we're doing this instead. So before we even got to that point with the $200,000 ad, we had submitted a different product in the specs, right? We didn't go to them and say no PVC. We never had the conversation at all. We just didn't specify PVC. So when the contractor went through and be like, oh, and we're doing this ad over what we typically do, we had the product and the product was durable and the product was easy to maintain and it just happened to be non-toxic. It was one of those bio-based oil resilient flooring products that Mohawk or whoever has and there's a cost premium for it. Um, but you're not losing the qualities that are essential for either, for either healthcare or for housing projects. And then what we've now discovered is that becomes the story. Yeah. And once the building's built, it is the story that that is like the, the lead in every, in every article right. about the building anyway. So they're suddenly so proud of themselves yeah. for doing it. Exactly. But getting them to that, beyond that, but, but, but. Right. So point. you can, I mean, we can, you can take people to installations of this. You can let them talk to maintenance people where, who have been experiencing with different products. Um, yeah, a lot of it is just getting these people comfortable with something that they're just not familiar with. And it, as a follow-up to this, yeah. and you alluded to this in your talk, but how do you deal, how do you also deal with this when they're complaining about nickels when at the same time they've picked out a $120,000 Chihuly Right, so chandelier. I go straight to the Chihuly, <laughs> I go straight to the Chihuly <laughs> the chandelier. Yeah. Um, and I used to deal with this a lot, when I was at Lake Flato, we did a lot of single family residential, right? And the client would, like a multi-millionaire would be like, oh, I can't afford the whatever. And I'd be like, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, but I've only budgeted $10 million for this project. It's like, okay, we can use those $10 million in a way that gets everything you need. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's why I shared this slide around cost is based on priorities and priorities are based on knowledge and values. And the knowledge and priority and knowledge and values is really where you can impact cost. Because it's not true that you can't afford the solar panels or can't afford the insulation. It's that you prioritize something different because you hold certain values and because you have a certain level of knowledge, right? People know exactly what they're getting with the Chihuly chandelier. They don't know exactly what they're getting with that additional inch of exterior insulation um, because comfort, additional comfort is something, it's a more ephemeral conversation. Right. But we have the ability to educate our clients and be like, actually your experience will be so much better with that half inch of continuous rigid because you'll be comfortable near the wall in the window. Right? And there's a lot of value in being comfortable near the wall in the window. This, but it's a challenge, right? It's always because you have to you have to communicate these un, non tangibles. Yeah, you have to make them want it and yeah. see the value in it. Yeah. And so this question kind of ties to that. How do you manage over budget roadblocks, especially when things like mass timber, which have been value engineered out on so many of our projects, uh, our clients would rather cut mass timber before cutting area or square footage? Yeah, um, and I mean, obviously, the best thing to cut if you run over your <laughs> over budget is area and square footage, right? You want the highest quality project, not the largest project. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, we've had a lot more success with wood than other regions, which makes perfect sense. Like we're doing, Boar's doing two high schools in Portland right now. Both of them are designed to be mass timber. Um, the client was very skeptical the whole way. We were so rigorous around our column grid, around our consistent sizing. We basically designed the building using every trick in the book to keep the cost of the structural system as small as possible. And when the bids came in, the mass timber was slightly under the steel structure. And suddenly all the apprehension evaporated. Right. Um, but if we hadn't been so careful with our design and we had deep beams or large expanses or cantilevers, like it gets very expensive and then it's very, very easy to cut. So when you're doing something that the client is already somewhat uncomfortable with, you really have to do it really well. <laughs> um, you don't necessarily need to be the lowest price, but it needs to be close, right? It needs to be basically um, a fairly equal exchange or a fairly clear explanation about why it's better and what the value of the client is. Yeah, I think the that. trap that we fell into was we had a number of projects that were conceived of as concrete, 
with a 31 six square grid and then we were going to make it mass timber right. instead and of you can only go the other way right, right. you instead can start of with mass timber right you can always make it concrete if you like really want to at the end but you can't take a concrete frame and make it mass timber right exactly okay um, any questions in the room while well, we have a few all in the room they're all the camera can't see this but they're smiling they're they're not here against their will <laughs> i mean maybe some of them are but any questions yeah, i'm sure you have a question well, i do have a question i know you do Hi, Corey. Uh, so my question is maybe more systematic in that I'm involved in a project, a very large project right now with another architectural firm. They are the design lead firm. And I'm trying to think of how I can start to influence some choices made by them prior to sharing with client on these kind of site specific orientation, materials, all glass elements. Um, any tips on how to do that without stepping on toes? Yeah, no, it's definitely a challenge. So one of the reasons, I shared at, at Bora, we didn't have a partner architect for the library that I just shared, um, but we do have partner architects in other projects, in other large projects. So the example that I'll give is, um, is Jefferson High School, which Bora is currently working on. We're partnered with Lever here in town. Um, and we started the project with the integrated design charrette, or the sustainability visioning charrette, that kind of I shared that image of. Um, and it was really essential that we did that with the client and with all the players, right? So at the very beginning of the project, you have um, both of the architects, all the contract, all the, we didn't have a contract yet, all the consultants and the, and the client really discussing priorities together. Um, without doing that at the beginning of the project, it's very difficult <laughs> to then come to some sort of value-based agreement later on. Um, but I would say that if you do have a split like a design architect versus a kind of architect of record, there's different possibility, like there's just different scopes and you can focus on different things. So like the design architect might get to decide the glass box versus non-glass box, but the architect record gets to decide a lot about the material specifications, right? And the constructability and um, so yes, again, definitely talk to the client, about, <laughs> not the client, talk to the other, the other architect about the options and opportunities that they have and why one strategy might be better than another strategy. But also, whatever role of the project you have, there's very specific avenues for improving the project. We are unfortunately out of time. Big round of applause. Make them hear it all across the country. Here, here. This is the book. Put it up for them, right there. Uh, I also am going to get them to sign some stickers because a few people have won the raffle for this book. So oh. we'll have you sign it that way. Okay. So you hear that? Uh, thank you on behalf of Canon Design. Thank you for well, thank coming you. out and doing this. Thank you for moving to Portland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, My pleasure. And, and uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you all listening uh, in the comfort of your pajamas at home. So uh, with that, we'll uh, close uh, this, uh, this session. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.